Hi everyone, welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Clark Wolf, and this is our daily show bringing you the latest in movie news and insight as to what it all means. Joining me as always is AMC Movie News Editor-in-Chief John Campia. John, hello. Hello, greetings and salutations everybody. Today's moment of insight. I'm going to reveal a little bit of truth about myself. When uh, I was a kid, my very first Dungeons and Dragons, we're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons later, my very first Dungeons and Dragons character was a wizard that I named Zap. Yes, <laughs> Zap. Very creative. And also joining us this morning is the director of the upcoming The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, Mr. John Schnepp. John, good morning. Good morning. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. Okay, here we go. Let's dive right in. A new report from The Hollywood Reporter today claims that Robert Downey Jr. met with Marvel President Kevin Feige last night to begin laying out the groundwork for his return as Iron Man. The report claims the negotiations focused on the upcoming Avengers 2 and a third Avengers film. A fourth Iron Man film was said not to be included in the talks as it is unclear if Downey Jr. is interested in another standalone feature as the character. What is more interesting in the report is what films Marvel is developing for its cinematic universe. It claims Marvel has scripts in development for Miss Marvel and a reboot of the character Blade, whose screen rights were recently returned to Marvel. Other films still in the works at Marvel with no production date or official green light include Doctor Strange, Iron Fist, Black Panther, and The Runaways. John, what stands out to you most in this story? A couple things that really jump out to me about this. Number one, love the fact that they're talking about a Miss Marvel film. Yeah. If for no other reason, then it is absolutely time that we try to get, we try again, I know, <laughs> Electra, but it's time we try again to give a female superhero a real shot in today's modern, you know, superhero context. And if, you know, DC isn't going to do it with Wonder Woman, then let's do it with Miss Marvel. I love that idea. The other thing, obviously is that they are actually thinking about rebooting Blade. Yeah. I thought they just might repackage Blade and give it away. I'm really happy to hear that they are actually having some talks about rebooting Blade. But the the nice little surprise in all this for me, Schnepp, and I'm dying to hear your thoughts mm -hmm. on this, is that they're talking Runaways. I had, I gotta admit right up front, I didn't even hear about the Runaways till about six months ago. My wife, Ann, came home. My wife is a real geek. She came home with this big stack of comics that she picked up, all, all called the Runaways. I was like, I'm not even familiar with the Runaways. And she read them and loved them, and I've started to flip through them too. This is a really cool story. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought in a million years they'd try to do this in a film, and apparently Marvel is looking at it. So anyway, Schnepp, what about you? You're looking at this huge list, all this information that's in there. What do you think about this? Uh, hearing about all these other characters that, you know, we're talking about that, too. I mean, M Marvel has so many amazing characters that have not even been scratched at yet, let alone, like, re reintroducing Blade into the Marvel Universe. Blade was Marvel's first hit. So it makes sense that they'd be like, nah, hang on, we're glad we got it back. Let's, you know, now we can integrate Blade in and maybe get, get some of that werewolf of, you know, werewolf at night, Morbius, get the whole, like, supernatural thing. Maybe Blade and Ghost Rider can be in the same movie, you know? Runaways, I love that because it's got Aaron Stack, Machine Man. I mean, it's like, it's a really interesting uh, take on a lot of characters, you know? It's like, it's a, a young adult Marvel. So hmm. I can see why they're, they're definitely pushing that. The most interesting thing to me was Miss Marvel. I was like, I never even heard of that until this morning when I saw the notes. <laughs> wow. So, I was like, wow, Miss Marvel, that, that, that makes sense. Bring that up. Make that happen. Break out the 20-sided die and dust it off. It's being reported that Warner Brothers is bringing back Dungeons & Dragons. Do -do. <laughs> the insanely popular role-playing game was turned into a feature film back in 2000 and was a disaster on every level. I totally saw it in the theaters. <laughs> However, <laughs> Warner is ready to take another shot. Rather, the Titans screenwriter David Leslie Johnson has been hired to develop the script with a potential early 2014 production start date. Schnepp, are you ready for more D&D? Oh, oh, am I am I ready? Oh. <laughs> uh, I might be ready for a little more D and D. I don't know. Not so sure about the D and D aspects of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. If I'm, <laughs> I'm ready for some D and D activity, don't know about that. But I'm really ready. I can't wait for them to do a proper Dungeons and Dragons movie. I mean, that Dungeons and Dragons movie that was made in 2000. The guy with the stretch ears <clears throat> had Thora Birch, the original Dungeons and Dragons. She was the best part of that movie, to be honest with you. Um, 
I can't wait to see what Warner Brothers is going to do with franchising out the Dungeons and Dragons and trying to turn that into like a 25 films, like roll 20 films, you know? I, I'm excited. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I think, you know, the, that 2000 Dungeons and Dragons to me was always kind of, it has been my poster child and my main argument against, you know, sometimes when you hear fans of source material say, Oh, if you're doing a movie of this, whether it's a comic book or a young adult novel book, whatever, they say, you got to make sure you get a real fan of that comic or a real fan of that book to direct it. Because unless it's somebody who's a real fan of the source material, they won't do it right. And my, my argument against that has always been the 2000 Dungeons and Dragons. Because they said part of their big marketing was, we went out and we made sure we, could, we found one of the biggest fans of Dungeons and Dragons we could. And they got this guy named Courtney Solomon to come in and direct it because they they thought hey number one priority isn't getting a good director number one priority is getting a real fan of the material that's to me is a huge mm -hmm. fallacy you get somebody who's a great director who can take that script whatever it is and turn it into a great motion picture if they're a fan bonus if they're not whatever because Christopher Nolan wasn't a huge fan of Batman before point. he did Batman Begins and look what we right. got mm -hmm. something awesome so anyway um yeah that movie was so bad. Was it was that a Wayans brother, by the way? I, it, was, it was. And also it was. It was a Wayans brother. Oh my movie. gosh! And all I remember, I remember is Jeremy, Jeremy Irons. Irons. Like, I will destroy you and dragons flying around. He's yeah, like, and Jeremy ah, Irons. Jeremy it's Irons like, is what, epic. dude? What are you doing in there? <laughs> that movie was so off. I get. I got to watch it tonight. Now I just. I have to watch yes. it tonight. That movie's so bad. So, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I'm there totally on board. Listen, right up. I I love role playing games. I do. I love tabletop, real dice, pencil and paper. Although I admit I lose my laptop a lot. Um, role playing games. Like me and a bunch of friends just like six months ago, we were playing the Star Wars RPG from West End Games. I haven't played Dungeons and Dragons in years, but I'm a huge schnep. We gotta get a game. We've got to yeah, get a know, game of D&D &D go. We should do a game live on AMC Movie. Talk. We should nice. play a game of D&D &D as we're doing AMC Movie Talk sometime. I'm 100% in. We'll roll our characters before we do it because that takes a long time. But yeah, I was doing like a, we did like a Dungeons and Dragons live show at the Steve Allen Theater like two years ago. We did about eight episodes where we'd roll and we'd have a video camera so you could see what the die was. So it wasn't a sold out crowd, believe me. It was like, you know, <laughs> around, like, you know maybe 15, 25 people at max. But I swear to God, I rolled 20 twice. <laughs> What's up, son? Magic hand. <laughs> All right, folks. So this next story contains a spoiler for the end credits of Wolverine. So if you do not want to hear it, fast forward to the next segment now. Okay, fast forward the video to the next topic. You've been warned. Are you ready? Okay. If you're still watching. Ah, bah, bah, spoilers. Ah, bah, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm ah, sorry, ah, Schnepp. Ah, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> you have been warned, though. You knew when you signed on to come in today, this is what you were getting. Okay. If you're still watching, here we go. Reports have come in that a small reshoot for the film has taken place in Montreal. According to Joe Blow, a short scene was being filmed potentially for a post credit stinger like Nick Fury's appearance in Iron Man that we saw Wolverine entering an airport and being greeted by Patrick Stewart as Professor Xavier walking. John, does this sound good to you? This sounds great to me. I think, you know, one of the things we know from X-Men 3, Professor Charles Xavier dies, mm -hmm. but then the post credit scene in that, he has somehow transported his consciousness from his now dead body into the body of his twin brother that is laying in that hosp hospital with Moria Mataggart. Mm -hmm. So, and it's completely feasible that that body was not shot in the spine, you know, and that he is able to walk. So I think this is a foreshadowing of us going into Days of Future Past. Mm -hmm. So me personally, I think this sounds fantastic. I'm really excited about it. I love these post credit scenes. Schnepp, what do you think? Well, now that the ending of Wolverine has been spoiled for me, <laughs> um, which I didn't, wasn't really looking forward to on this episode of AMC Movie Talk, <laughs> I'll just have to deal with it. Um, uh, Patrick Stewart back as uh, Charles Xavier, skimping around, doing some dancing, no need for the wheelchair. Uh, does that mean he's going to be jumping around in Days of Future Past? I, I guess so. I'm going to assume this like so. Them saying they're, are they going to rock another X-Men movie? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it means. Uh, it sounds cool, though. I mean, I just want to see the Wolverine. I, that, that, like, the, after seeing all these trailers, I'm like, bring that movie. How come August isn't here yet? Yeah. I'm sick of waiting. Yeah, me so. too. 
All right, folks, well, listen, we've come to that part of the show for buy and sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Clark's got a bunch of other issues from the world of movie news. She's going to list them off, and Schnepp and I are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Clark, what do we got? First up, Martin Scorsese's silence has found its lead actor as the ama amazing Spider-Man star Andrew Garfield has come on board the project to headline. The drama, based on the novel by Shuseiku Endo, is set in the 17th century as two Jesuit priests face violence and persecution when they travel to Japan to locate their mentor and to spread the gospel of Christianity. Schnepp, buy or sell Garfield on silence. I buy it. I can't wait to see uh, Martin Scorsese and and in religion combined is always a good film. Last Temptation of Christ. I say bring in Peter Gabriel to do the music. <laughs> you got a hit. I want to see Salisbury Hill. Yeah, I'm going to buy this as well for no other reason than, than Andrew Garfield. I have been heaping praises on this kid ever since I saw him in The Social Network. He was the heart and soul of that movie. He brought the humanity to it. I think he's been an amazing Peter Parker. Uh, so, yeah, teaming him up with Martin Scorsese, who only picks amazing actors, for me, it's definitely a buy. Cool. All right, next up. Sony has officially announced that Iron Man 3 director Shane Black will direct the upcoming Doc Savage. One of the most popular characters of the pulps of the 30s and 40s, Doc Savage was also popularized on radio, film, and television. He is a scientist, a physician, adventurer, inventor, explorer, and researcher. My mother would want me to date him, probably. <laughs> he has been trained since birth to be nearly superhuman in every way, with outstanding strength, a photographic memory, and vast knowledge and intelligence. He uses his skills and powers to punish evil wherever in the world he finds it. John buy or sell Black directing Doc Savage. I gotta buy it. I really yeah. love Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I love the job Black did with Iron Man 3 and I think this sounds like a really cool thing. Now sometimes I'm critical of human characters that they just make sound too perfect mm -hmm. but this sounds like fun. I, I really hope they do set it in its contextual period as well. Yes. I'd love to see this like set in the 40s or 50s or something like that. I think that'd be really cool so for me it's definitely a buy. Schnepp what about you? John, I'm going to have to agree with you again because that's all I really do on the show is agree with you. That's how I agree with you. <laughs> Constantly agreeing with John Campia. Snap, why don't you get your own opinion? <laughs> anyway, buying. Uh, Shane Black, amazing writer. So I'm not a big Doc Savage fan, but with Shane Black writing and directing it, I'm in because I know he's going to make it funny and fun to watch. So I'm buying. Agreed. Great minds think alike. I'm a buy as well. <laughs> all right. Everything now appears to be in place for Hot Tub Time Machine 2. It's being reported that Parks and Rec star Adam Scott is in talks to take the leading role as John Cusack will not be returning. Scott will be playing a new character and not taking over Cusack's character from the first movie. Schnepp, buy or sell Scott in Hot Tub Time Machine 2. I'm going to buy it because I liked Hot Tub Time Machine, the first one. It was so stupid and funny. <laughs> um, and that John Cusack's not in it, it actually is probably going to help the uh, sequel a little bit because they could still have those other bozos in it something went wrong and this is another dude who's like got in the time machine they could figure it out but adam scott's really funny so i buy it i gotta buy it too i love adam scott this guy he's so great on parks and recreation he's he's always overlooked whenever you talk about the genius that is Step Brothers. he's always <laughs> overlooked i thought he was so awesome in that movie and i think he's weird. and look i love the first hot tub time machine and i'm a big john cusack fan but i've always said Oddly enough, out of all those four guys, Cusack is probably the one you could take out and still have it really feel like Hot Tub Time Machine. And uh, Adam Scott's uh, addition to this, I, I think, is great. So, yeah, for me, it's a buy. Cool. All right. Jurassic Park 4 has run into some significant trouble as there are some conflicting reports that the film is either indefinitely delayed or just on a short hiatus. Reports have come out that Universal is not seeing eye to eye with some of the development crew, and some people are being laid off and let go while these issues get sorted out. However, Colin Trevorrow is still very much directing. John, buy or sell Jurassic Park 4 delay with the release date just over a year away. I gotta sell this. I mean, look, Universal, you should have... Filmmaking is a huge, huge undertaking. It's very complex. It's very complicated. But you should know to have your ducks in a row by the time you hit certain points and setting release dates and doing all this kind of... Why are these issues coming up? Why have these issues not been resolved and settled a long time ago while we're one year away from the release date when you don't even have a cast for this movie yet? Yeah, yeah no, this is terrible. They're never going to hit their release date in a million years. No way this is coming out on its release date. So for me, it's a sell. Snap, what about you? I'm going to buy it, even though I, like, I'm buying that they don't make it, because I, I don't think they should make it. 
I, I think uh, Jurassic Park 1, 2, and 3 is it. And, you know, you could watch those again. They tried making Jurassic 4 like 10 years ago. They tried making it five years ago. I don't know. I just think, you know, just open the theme park, you know. All right. That's it. Well, listen, we've come to that part of the show for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you would like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. We get a whole bunch of questions from you guys every day, but send them on in. We pick a few out of the mailbag and address them on the show. Clark's got a few of them pulled out. So, Clark, what do we got? All right. Jacob Ballard writes, I love this show. I am a Nolanite. I loved Inception. I heard that the contract for the major actors included being signed on for a sequel. My question is if this will ever happen, and should it ever happen? In other words, is a masterpiece like Inception better as a standalone, or should it expand? The other issue it would face is if there was a sequel, they would have to reveal the truth about that ending, which would upset half the fans right off the bat. Um, first of all, uh, most actors, when they sign on for a film, they usually sign a clause that the, that the studio has an option for a sequel if they ever so choose to go that way. So that's not exceptional in this case. I mean, that's, that's pretty standard. Um, no, Inception is not a movie that should ever have a sequel. Ever. Um, it's great as a standalone. And one of the things is, what do you do in the next one? Well, I mean, what, where do you go? Do you, now, or, wait a minute, Leonardo DiCaprio says. What if we go into a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream and then the next one is like eight deep eight <laughs> layers deep in dreams and where do you go the novelty's done yeah. the novelty of that concept is done and it's perfect and it's great i did not like the ending when i say the ending of inception i mean the very very you know the spinning top thing mm -hmm. to me that was a cop out i don't like it when movies do that but that's that two second shot is my biggest problem with that huge movie, which is so great and so wonderful. Leave it alone. I think a sequel could go could go nowhere, but make it into a novelty. I, I think you're done. Schnepp, what do you think about the idea of a, an Inception sequel? I uh, yeah, I gotta agree. I I don't think a, a sequel to Inception is gonna do anything. I mean, go back into his history, watch all his films again, and think about making a sequel to every single one of his standalone films. The only <laughs> films that he's actually done a sequel to are films that needed a sequel. Batman. So, a lot of filmmakers just make one film, and films aren't films are different than television shows. They're not built to be sequels except for these giant event films that we are always talking about which are like superheroes or adventure or science fiction i mean a lot of films are just stories that are just told beginning middle end and i think inception is an incredible film i love it i don't want to see inception too noel hernandez writes big fan of the show for months now thanks for all the great news and commentary so i was wondering given the trend and success of blockbuster comic book movie adaptations do you think that the academy will ever eventually recognize some of our movies and actors with any kind of regularity it's a little ridiculous that billion dollar movies like avengers and dark knight rises can get little or no nominations when the fans are clearly speaking by supporting these movies in droves despite all of the movie piracy that happens today. I think it's high time for the old school academy to catch up and give these movies a chance to vote with an open mind. Um, thank you so much for the question and no, I, I, this is a debate I have to have with friends of mine quite often because as you know, if you watch the show, you know I, I'm a huge comic book movie fan. I'm a huge genre movie fan. It's what I spend most of my time talking about and obsessing about and dreaming about. I won't go into all that. <laughs> um, but I, I got to tell you, no, uh, yeah. No. Look, there's just because something's successful, we say this all the time, just because something's successful doesn't mean it's good. And I have this this big army. Like, the fans are speaking, everybody's going to see Avengers, right? Mm -hmm. Avengers, which everybody knows is my favorite film of last year. But I don't think it was the best film of last year. Right. But it is my favorite. But there's this, because everybody's a billion dollar movie. That means the fans are voting. Well, no, that means the marketing enticed them to want to go to see it. That's all it means. And look, I, I used to say this before about the MTV Movie Awards or any mm -hmm. fake movie awards that is fan voted. Fan voting, as soon as you tell me an award is fan voted, to me, it's completely irrelevant. You know why? Because what use is an award where the people who vote are people who see maybe 10 movies a year? Do, do I want an award where the people who are voting on it are people who see 10 movies a year when there's 400 movies? Right. Do I want a guy voting on who's the best NBA player in the league who only watches one team? Right. It makes no sense. So, so no. And look, the whole idea that they had, uh, that they never credit genre films. Look, 
About a few years ago, once again, me saying something unpopular. I'm going to read this to you. A few years ago, I wrote when The Dark Knight came out and wasn't nominated for an, for an Academy Award. A lot of people got their panties in a twist and got very upset. I wrote an article, was probably one of the most read articles I've ever written in my life, called An Inconvenient Truth, The Dark Knight Didn't Deserve a Nomination. Now, I'm going to read this to you uh, ad nauseum here, so just follow me, and, and it addresses some of the things that you're mentioning. Here's what I wrote. I'm picking up about halfway through the article. The film was too long. All the mobsters, besides the Joker himself, were dreadful. The boat scene was so terrible, it risked ruining the grittiness of the film. The way they wasted Two-Face, not Harvey, was a joke. And Bale's Batman voice got worse than it was in the first one. These are real issues that very few seem willing to acknowledge. Just a few too many things, again in my opinion, to make it a lock for an Oscar nomination. Some people, including a bunch of people that I really respect, are suggesting that The Dark Knight was purposefully snubbed at the Academy Awards because it's a genre film. The suggestion is that the 6,000 voting members all somehow collectively decided that they hate genre films and they would not allow a genre film to get an Oscar nomination on their watch. <laughs> the problem with that logic is summed up in five simple words. The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings trilogy, by any definition, are a set of genre films. The ultimate geek movies, really. Wizards and trolls, swords and monsters, elves and woodland kingdoms with magic rings and potions. That sounds like my Saturday nights. Anyway, the, <laughs> the Lord of the Rings films are geek genre films. And yet, all three of them got nominated for Best Picture. And The Return of the King tied the record for most Oscar wins by taking home 11 awards, winning in every single category it was nominated for. So please don't try to suggest that the Academy is just out to snub genre films, because that's just silly. The Oscar is a, a tough award to win. Over 4,000 full-length feature films were produced last year in the U.S., and of those 4,000-plus movies, only five can be nominated. At the time, those were the rules. Add on top of that the fact that film is subjective and each member of the Academy will have a slightly different view from the next. There can only be five, and The Dark Knight wasn't one of them. All things considered, I don't think it's all that surprising, all that unjust, and realistically was not a snub in the least. So, yeah, look, once again, just because people go out and see movies, just because they make billions of dollars, just because this, just because of that, doesn't mean that they were the best films of the year. And people who watch 400, 500 movies a year, and people who have spent 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years making films are the ones who are kind of judging it and evaluate it. I take their opinions over our opinions as fans any day of the week when putting these things together. And The Lord of the Rings does prove that they're not out to snub genre films. They're just not. That's my opinion on it at any rate. I know a lot of you guys have different opinions. I'm sure Schnepp has a different opinion, except for the fact that he always agrees with me about everything. <laughs> so Schnepp, yeah. what, what, what do you think about this? Like, should the Academy just, in principle alone, start nominating more comic book films just because they're successful? No, I mean, I think, I mean, you nailed it. You pretty much said a lot because of what I think, you know, you nailed a lot of that stuff. I mean, the the Joker won a posthumous award. I mean, Lord of the Rings won. There's many different, you know, benchmarks where science fiction or superhero or genre pictures have gotten into the Academy. But uh, I, there's also a thing about uh, you got to kind of stump for the Oscars. Um, the Avengers was on one ballot because Marvel didn't do any any advertising to the for the Oscars. So that's another right. thing that ha plays heavily into the voting scenario for the Oscars is even though like professionals vote for the Oscars, like, you know, everyone in the WGA, everyone in SAG, everyone in the, the DGA, all the writers and the, art the actors, everyone votes for the Oscars. But they have to be, you know, kind of, you know, so many movies come out in one year that really the Academy has to send out all these DVDs to remind you about like, oh, remember this movie that came out in October? Check it out. Watch it again. Vote for it. So Marvel didn't do that for the Avengers. They didn't do any advertising. So that's another reason that falls into like, hey, they didn't. They got one vote. You know, they got one nomination, because you know, you, in, in the in the, the whole thing about awards is you have to like make people aware of your movie. Yeah, so it's an awareness point. factor too that yeah. falls in. That's the my voters additional. The voters are human, right? I mean, we got to be yeah. reminded. You got to put it in front of their faces, and and if yep. they don't do that, it's going to be an uphill uh, an uphill battle. Plus, yep. Noel, if you if you go by that logic, Twilight maybe should be nominated because think it about it. Made so much. It money. makes a lot of money, <laughs> and the fans really love it. 
I'm not going to say either way. I'm just saying think about it like that. Right. Okay. Next up, Stephen Morton writes, straight to business, Mr. Campia. Ah. You stated that Marvel Studios have the right to take liberty with alteration of events when it comes to comics to film interpretations. In the case of Marvel Studio films, I have to tell you that you could not be more wrong. Case in point, Infinity Gauntlet shown in Thor conventions. No story can be told without Silver Surfer, Thanos, and most importantly, Adam Warlock. You have to remember that the 616 Marvel Universe has never been rebooted, unlike DC's New 52, so this is a terrible idea. I say it's terrible because Marvel Studio films have directly impacted the Marvel 616, Iron Man, Nick Fury Jr., Agent Coulson, Hawkeye, etc., and that is not a good thing. Marvel is kicking butt in terms of films ROI, but DC has maintained its reputation with the Dark Knight trilogy because it straightaway distanced itself from the DCU. Superhero films will fade in time, and all that will be left are us comic book fans. Studios need to quit betraying us, aka Mandarin, for the masses are fickle and they will turn their backs in an instant. Thank you so much for that, uh, <laughs> for that passionate email, uh, Stephen. Uh, I love passionate emails, and I love it when, when people say that I'm wrong. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to let me say this. You bring up several really key issues, but let me start with this big, big general one. For 12, 15 years now, I have been hearing people every year talk about how superhero movies are going to be dead soon. They said it 15 years ago. They said it 12 years ago, they said it 10 years ago, they said it eight years ago, they said it five years ago, they said it last year. Superhero movies are dying, they're gonna die eventually. Really? Iron Man just opened with $700 million in its opening week. Don't talk to me about how superhero movies are dying. And guess what? Back in 1999, the comic book industry was almost dead. Marvel had to file for bankruptcy. They had to sell off the rights to Spider-Man and stuff like that just to keep their heads above water. So look, everything, comic books itself and comic book movies, everything ebbs and flows. Everything has their cycles. And sure, there's going to come a period of time, although I don't know when it's going to be, when superhero movies go on a bit of a decline and then they'll come back much like the comic book industry as a whole but you've raised a couple other things talking about how look you you have to be faithful to the comic book material i said this before i'll say it again the movies are the movies the books are the books mm -hmm. if you've got a problem my brother about uh, marvel changing things in the comic books to suit the movies, we'll take that up with Marvel. That's a comic book issue. They shouldn't do that. The comic books should not be influenced by the movies. They should just be their own thing. And I agree with you on that, but don't blame the movies for that. You need to do what you need to do to make the best movie possible. And that is ultimately the most important thing about all this. Now, this brings up another thing that I've been wanting to say. You know, a lot of, and I can't wait to hear what Schnepp has to say about this. <laughs> a lot of people always harp and whine that critics are disconnected from the fans that's that's really not true mm -hmm. whenever especially 99% of the time when you look at critic ratings versus audience ratings they're usually not all that far apart sometimes they're really far apart and sometimes most of the time they're not all that far apart I want to suggest to you there is a much bigger uh, chasm and a much bigger disconnect between source material fans and comic book fans and movie fans, mm -hmm. there is a much bigger disconnect because if you read the comic fans chat boards and stuff like that, the people who are really into the comics, you would think that Iron Man 3 is one of the worst films ever made. They, they, it's terrible, it's awful, it does this and it does this and it does this. If you just read those chat boards, you think it was terrible. Mm -hmm. But look at the audience rating. The audience rating is 85%. The critic rating is 78%. There is a massive disconnect between the people who are comic book fans, like me, <laughs> um, and the, the average regular going movie fan. Because Marvel made a great movie that the audiences loved and the critics loved. And then off in this corner is this tiny, tiny little segment of the population, which we don't admit often enough that we, as comic book fans, are a tiny, tiny segment. Off way in the corner are us complaining about Iron Man 3 and talking about how terrible it is when the rest of the world sees it completely differently. There is the big disconnect. And that's why when a lot of comic book fans like come to me and say, mm -hmm. oh, such and such comic book is so awesome. It would make a great movie. The studios are stupid if they don't make this movie. I'd say, 
dude, there's a disconnect between you and what the yeah, regular movie going audience are. Because just because you and the rest of us who are fans of that character think it might make a great movie doesn't mean the larger movie going audience would. And there's that disconnect. Anyway, I, I'm going on too long about this. Schnepp, what are your thoughts on, on uh, this email we got from Steven? Let me, uh, let me start from the end. I think <clears throat> even within the small micro niche of actual comic book readers that still exists on this planet, there's a disparity right there. I read comics every week. I'm a comic book reader. I loved Iron Man. I, Great point. I'm just not going to get online and type about it. I can't believe the Mandarin, blah, blah, blah. It's like <laughs> I'm not vocal in a, in a way that super, super, ultra, super comic book fans who feel like they've been betrayed are. So that's, that's even another micro percentage of just if you take the 10% of comic book fans and, you know, out of the 100%, and then make that 100%, there's like a 10% of those who are like vocally angry and will say it. So, right. I mean, I, I'm an Iron Man fan. I've been since I was a kid, and I loved the Iron Man 3 movie. And I'm totally okay with them changing things that were from 50 years of storytelling. So when you start to get so micro nerdy about facts and things like, Thanos has to be part of the Infinity Gauntlet with the Silver Surfer. No, he doesn't. It doesn't have to be. It's Correct. a movie. You have the comic book. You could refer to that for the rest of your life. You have it hardbound, and it's on your it's on your library shelf. There's the Silver Surfer Infinity Gauntlet trilogy, or whatever. How many issues? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, the Silver Surfer has nothing to do with Thanos and in the Infinity Gauntlet in the Marvel universe because Silver Surfer isn't owned by Marvel. He's right. owned by uh, by Fox. So, sorry. That's how it is. Silver Surfer is owned by Fox. Fantastic Four is owned by Fox. Right now, in this time period that you're existing in with us, it's just not going to happen as a movie. You can reread the comic. There can be brand new comics with Silver Surfer fighting Thanos over the Infinity Gauntlet. But in the actual cinematic world, simply not going to happen. So here's another thing. When Batman came out, the DC Comics universe adapted to the hit that was Batman the mm, movie true. and changed his outfit into an all black outfit and guess what fans loved it mm. yeah and I saw so, you know, talking about Dark Knight I remember a, a lot of people not a lot but there was a small segment of people that were absolutely hated Dark Knight with Heath Ledger because everybody knows that Joker was born when Batman dropped him into a vat of acid men and they got it wrong and it ruined yep. the movie <laughs> no yep. the yeah. rest of us love the Dark Knight it's what are you talking totally about totally awesome yeah, yeah, perfect re-origin. You know, it's like you ha you'll always have the original origin, and you also have the original Batman that Tim Burton made. You have all these different iterations of Batman on TV and film. And guess what? There's going to be a new Batman, too. So maybe you'll get your chance to have the Joker born the way you want him to be born, but it's probably not going to happen. So, All right, so listen, folks, we've gone way over time. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, while I've got you, take a second and click that subscribe button. Become a subscriber to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It'll keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news and, of course, our daily AMC Movie Talk Show. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash AMC Theaters. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash AMC Theaters. And if you want an audio-only version of this episode, look in the description of this video video for our iTunes and Stitcher radio links. Once again, folks, thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank our lovely host, Miss Clark Wolf. Thank you for having me, John. The one and the only Mr. John Schnepp. I'm going full rhino. <laughs> <laughs> and most of all, thank you to you guys. Listen, what we have to say on this show is completely irrelevant. The most important part of the show is what you have to say. Make sure you jump down to the comments section of this video and leave your thoughts on any or all of the topics that we discussed here today. So until tomorrow, thanks again for joining us. My name is John Campion for AMC Movie News. Bye-bye.